So eating is fundamental to all animal type organisms. The food provides the structural components for the body and it also provides the energy for the physiology of the body. So this means all anatomy and all physiology is dependent on nutrition and digestive processes. So let's get right down to this topic now. So the function of the digestive system can be summarised in four relatively straightforward processes. Ingestion, digestion, absorption and elimination. Now ingestion refers to taking food and water into the body. This is the process of eating and drinking. And ingested food molecules are often large and insoluble molecules. And in order for them to be absorbed into the body, they must first be broken down into smaller subunits. And this process of converting large ingested food molecules into a form which can be absorbed is termed digestion. And after food has been digested, it then must be absorbed into the blood or lymphatic system of the body before it can be utilised by different parts of the body. And the process whereby digested food is transferred from the lumen of the gut, that is the gap in the middle of the gastrointestinal tract, into the circulatory system is called absorption. Now not all ingested material is absorbed. Some will continue along the length of the digestive tract and is eliminated as waste. So fibre is not broken down by any digestive processes and is eliminated in the same form in which it was eaten. And water is absorbed and altered into the blood as well. Essentially, the gastrointestinal tract, or as we often just say, the GI tract, or the gut, is a single tube which runs from the mouth all the way to the anus. And the old-fashioned name for the gastrointestinal tract is the alimentary canal. And the digestive system consists of the organs which compose the gastrointestinal tract itself, and also, not shown on this diagram, the accessory organs of digestion. Now these accessory organs we'll look at in detail later on, but they're not part of the tract, but they produce and secrete fluids and enzymes essential for the digestive processes. And different sections of the gastrointestinal tract have different properties and diameters of the lumen, and uh, this allows for specific functions of different sections of the gastrointestinal tract. Now when you're learning any system there's a lot of things you either know or you don't know. Simple straightforward rote learning and the components of the gastrointestinal tract fall into that category. So the food pipe carrying the food down from the mouth into the stomach going through the thoracic cavity into the abdominal cavity is the esophagus. And if you're listening in the States, you don't put the O in front. You just spell it esophagus. In the UK, we spell it with an O. Taking food down into the stomach. From there, the food goes on to the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. Duo actually means 12. It was the first 12 inches of the small intestine using old fashioned units of length. And then the middle part of the small intestine is the jejunum. And the final part of the small intestine, as we see there, is the ileum. That takes material into the first part of the large intestine, which has got a larger lumen, it's a, got a wider diameter. That takes material into the cecum, and the appendix is an offshoot of that cecum. And of course, remember, we're looking at someone else's gastrointestinal tract here, so the cecum and the appendix are both on the right from there the material goes from the cecum up to the ascending colon. That bend there is actually called the hepatic flexure. That bend and then it bends and goes across the way travelling to the left. And the colon goes up the way. The bit that goes from the right to the left travelling across is the transverse colon. Then when it gets to the area of the spleen the colon will deflect downwards because the so called splenic flexure. Material will then go down the descending colon. 
Then the sigmoid colon is going back. It's going posteriorly towards the rectum and the anus. So you need to learn that diagram and the components of the gastrointestinal tract, the main large macroscopic anatomical components. Now this model gives us an overall feel for the layout, hopefully, of the gastrointestinal tract. Above in the thoracic cavity we can see the lungs. And then below the diaphragm, on the top right, we have the liver. And going over towards the left we have the stomach tucked under the liver. Then the stomach is going to deliver contents into the small intestine. Now the small intestine are called small because they have a narrower lumen not because they're short, they're actually quite long. Then the material will go into the colon and we can see the colon here in dark brown. We have the ascending, the transverse, and you can just see the bottom of the, uh, the descending starting to be the sigmoid on the bottom left of the anatomical specimen, which is the right when you're looking at it, of course, because we're always looking at someone else's anatomy. And the omentum you see there is a fold of fatty material that folds down over the top of the abdominal cavity, covering the organs of the gastrointestinal tract. And we'll see what the function of that is later on in this presentation. But that gives us an overall layout of the organs in relation to the gross anatomy of the body. Now to consider the structure of the gastrointestinal tract, it's useful to think about a cross-section of the layers because the walls of all the components of the gastrointestinal tract from the esophagus to the rectum have the same basic layered structure. The lumen is surrounded by a mucosa, submucosa, a muscular layer and an outer serosa or adventitia. So let's now look at these layers in more detail. The inner layer immediately surrounding the lumen is called the mucosa and this is composed of a mucous membrane and a mucous membrane is just a membrane which is lined with mucus. It's a simple layer of tissue which secretes mucus and is lined by mucus. A mucus is important because it protects the underlying cells and also acts as a lubricant to e ease the passage of material along the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract. The thickness of the mucosal epithelium varies along the length of the tract. In areas such as the mouth, esophagus and anus, which are subject to a lot of mechanical forces and abrasion, the mucosa is composed of a stratified epithelium containing several layers of cells. In sections associated with absorption, it's important for the lining to be thin enough to facilitate diffusion of nutrients. And in these areas, the mucosa is composed of a simple columnar epithelium, just one layer of cells thick, sitting on a basement membrane. And underneath the epithelium, but still part of the mucosa, is a layer of connective tissue containing small blood vessels, vital for taking oxygen and nutrients to the tissues and removing waste products such as carbon dioxide and nitrogen containing waste products of metabolism. The layer underneath the mucosa is the submucosa. And this is composed of loose connective tissues and also carries numerous blood vessels which perfuse the gut wall with blood. And in certain areas of the GI tract, the submucosa contains exocrine glands which produce some of the digestive enzymes. Areas of lymphatic tissue are found in the submucosa and these are referred to as lymphatic nodules and provide an immunological function. This layer also contains a network of intrinsic nerve fibres, collectively called the submucosal plexus. And plexus means a network of blood vessels or nerve fibres. 
Underneath the submucosa is the muscular layer or the muscularis. And there are two layers of smooth involuntary muscle. The outer layer is composed of longitudinal muscle fibers and the inner layer composed of circular muscle fibers. The wall of the stomach actually has an additional inner layer of muscle fibers which run obliquely. Activation of the muscle layer is coordinated by a network of intrinsic autonomic nerve fibers called the myenteric plexus. It's almost as if the gastrointestinal tract has got, has got its own internal nervous system. And contraction and relaxation of these muscle layers allows material to be propelled along the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract. And this muscle contraction also helps with the physical breakdown of food and aids in the mixing in of digestive enzymes to give a good mix. In addition to the involuntary muscles found in the wall of the gastrointestinal tract, the mouth, pharynx, esophagus and anus also contain some voluntary muscles under the control of the will. Now the outer layer is called the serosa. And this is composed of loose connective tissues with a serous membrane on the external surface of the bowel. Like all serous membranes, it secretes small volumes of serous fluid. Serous fluid means a fluid derived from the serum, that is from the plasma. And this acts as an external lubricant, allowing the sections of bowel to move freely over each other. Below the level of the diaphragm, the serosal layer is called the visceral peritoneum. And the importance of these loops of bowel being able to move freely over each other is seen in patients after peritonitis, for example, when they develop adhesions and the different parts of the loops of the intestine can stick together, leading to pathology and even potentially gastrointestinal obstruction. So we're now thinking about the gross anatomy of the gastrointestinal tract as it passes through the abdominal and uh, pelvic cavity. And to understand this, we must understand the peritoneum, which is a thin membrane which lines the surface of the organs in the abdominal cavity. And it also lines the inner abdominal wall. The peritoneum immediately surrounding the organs is referred to as the visceral peritoneum and the layer lining the abdominal wall as parietal. So again, parietal perimeter is on the outside. And between these two layers is a potential space called the peritoneal cavity, which contains serous lubricating fluid. And this allows areas of the intestine to move slightly relative to each other. So the lengths of the bowel can move relative to each other. And the parietal peritoneal membrane contains many pain receptors, which make it very sensitive to pain. And folds of the peritoneal membrane form the mesenteries, and we'll talk about those later. Now, abdominal organs which are suspended in the mesenteric folds of the peritoneum are described as intraperitoneal. For example, the large and the small intestine are mostly intraperitoneal. Other abdominal organs are outside the peritoneal cavity and are often only covered by peritoneum over one of their surfaces. And such organs are described as retroperitoneal. So for example, the pancreas and the kidneys are behind the peritoneal membrane, so they're retroperitoneal. Now, sometimes as a result of infection or after surgery, areas of the visceral and parietal peritoneum become physically contacted, uh, connected by scar tissue. So the inflammatory processes can lead to scar tissue formation. And this is adhesions that we've mentioned just before. And sometimes it requires surgery to separate adhesions. And if gastrointestinal contents escape through a perforation in the wall of the gut, through a, wall of, through a hole in the wall of the gastrointestinal tract, this will cause inflammation of the peritoneum as the contents of the gut get out into this peritoneal sac, 
Of course, the peritoneal sac is supposed to be sterile. And this is a life-threatening condition called peritonitis. And in other abnormal conditions, excessive volumes of fluid may accumulate in the peritoneal cavity, converting the potential space into an actual space. And if fluid fills up this peritoneal cavity, this is referred to as ascites. So you might see this, for example, in advanced cirrhosis of the liver or some malignant conditions where the peritoneal cavity fills up with fluid causing ascites. Now we can see that the esophagus is going through the thoracic cavity. Then moving on to the labels to the left on this diagram, we notice that the parietal pleural membrane is lining the lower surface of the diaphragm. And when we say lower surface of the diaphragm there, we mean the lower surface in the thoracic cavity. So remember, it's the pleural membranes that line the thoracic cavity. It's the peritoneal membranes that are in the abdominal cavity. So we see the visceral peritoneal membrane lines the outer surface of the GI tract. That's the visceral. And we see the parietal pleural membrane is lining the abdominal wall. So it's parietal on the outside, the perimeter of the abdomen, but of course it's on the inner side of the abdominal wall. And the parietal pleural membrane lines the surface of the pelvic organs as well on the bottom. Now going back to the top right, again we see esophagus in the thoracic cavity. Going down we see the potential space of the peritoneal cavity. Now you can't really draw a potential space, so this is just diagrammatic. But I think what you can see is we've got the abdominal walls, we've got the pelvic cavity, we've got the gut running through that, and between that we have this potential space of the peritoneal cavity. Now you can see that the inside of the gut there is labelled as the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract passing through the peritoneal cavity. Below we have the pelvic organs underneath the parietal peritoneal membrane and we see the anus going through out of the pelvic cavity. So I think you can see there that the gut is going through the thoracic cavity, the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity and the gastrointestinal tract is just this continuous tube at its simplest form it's just this continuous tube and of course inside that tube there's all sorts of bacteria Outside that tube, in the, in the potential space of the peritoneal cavity, for example, there it is completely sterile. And if anything gets from the lumen of the gut into the potential space of the peritoneal cavity, that's what causes life-threatening, potentially life-threatening peritonitis. The mesentery is fan-shaped, as we see in this diagram. Starting with a 15 centimetre length which connects the whole structure to the posterior abdominal wall. And this is this connecting structure is called the root of the mesentery. And by the time the same double sheet of mesentery reaches the small intestine, it's six metres long, so it fans out really quickly. And despite this length, the height is only 20 centimetres at the centre and much less towards the edges. Now major blood vessels supplying the gut run behind the peritoneum. They're retroperitoneal as we see in this diagram. And branches of the aorta project through the root of the mesentery, then travel through the mesentery to the small intestine. Because of course it's essential that the small intestine receives an arterial blood supply for oxygen and nutrients and everything that's required by those living tissues then this blood will circulate through the capillaries in the, in the gut and then venous branches drain from the gastrointestinal tract through the mesentery. So in the same way that the mesentery takes the arterial vessels to the gut, the venous vessels go back towards the root of the mesentery, again through the mesentery. And 
the veins go into the root of the mesentery into branches of what will become the hepatic portal vein. So the blood supply to the gut is coming from the aorta, that's the systemic arterial supply, but the venous drainage from virtually all of the gastrointestinal tract all drains back into the hepatic portal vein so that blood can go back to the liver where it can be processed. And this is very important because the nutrients from the gut need to go back to the liver to be processed. But the gut, of course, is full of bacteria and bacteria pro produce waste products. And these, these uh, waste products need to be broken down in the liver into non-toxic compounds. And if that didn't happen, that means that bacterial products from the gut will go straight into the venous blood. And then we would feel sick all of the time because of these toxins in the blood. But that doesn't happen because the venous blood drains to the liver and the liver detoxifies these toxins. And the toxins are detoxified because the blood is delivered to the liver via the hepatic portal vein. Peristalsis is the term that we use to describe the coordinated waves of muscular contraction that occur in the wall of the gastrointestinal tract. And indeed, peristalsis can occur in other places. The ureters come to mind, for example, conducting urine from the kidney down into the urinary bladder. Now, muscles in a short length of the gastrointestinal tract will contract, while those immediately in front will relax. And this allows content to be squeezed along the length of the lumen. The area of muscle which was relaxed then contracts, while the length in front of this section will relax, propelling the material further forward. And as a result of this coordinated muscular activity, waves of contraction pass along the length of the gastrointestinal tract wall, progressively transferring material from the mouth towards the direction of the rectum and anus. Peristalsia should always occur in the mouth to anus direction. But in vomiting, material is propelled in the opposite direction by antiperistalsis. First in the small intestine and then in the wall of the esophagus. And in this diagram we can see in the top area the muscle contraction behind the dark bolus of food. And then a short time later that wave of contraction and relaxation has moved along the lumen of the gut, propelling the material forward. Now what we see in this model is an orangey yellow type colour on the left of the abdomen that is on the right as you're looking at it. This is the greater omentum and this is a large apron-like peritoneal fold of tissue which lies in front of the organs of the gastrointestinal tract. So it goes over the organs almost like an internal type of apron. Now the omentum was described to me as the policeman of the abdomen by surgeons who were doing gastrointestinal surgery because it migrates to area, areas of infection or areas of perforation and it compartmentalizes those areas. So within the peritoneal sac that is a huge area covering all of the abdominal cavity and because it's a potential space it's a continuous potential space an infection could spread around that very readily once it was introduced. So it's very important that any infection that does get in there is not allowed to spread round, causing a global peritonitis, which would be a very dangerous, life-threatening condition. But the omentum can compartmentalise infection because it's able to seal off and consolidate areas of infection. Infection in the peritoneal cavity, of course, is peritonitis, which would be life-threatening. And in addition to this protective role, the omentum stores adipose tissue, it stores fat. And this is one reason why people often get fat abdomens if they become obese. And what we see here is the greater omentum, and there's actually another lesser omentum between the stomach, liver and duodenum. Now, if we eat more than our metabolic requirements, we're going to put weight on. If we eat less than our metabolic requirements, we're going to lose weight. 
So in order to homeostatically regulate body weight, we need to regulate appetite. And the desire to eat is stimulated by a specialized group of neurons in the hypothalamus. And these form what we call the appetite center. It's the hypothalamus which generates the sensation of hunger and the desire to search for food. And in addition, eating releases uh, and stimulates the release of dopamine from some of the areas of brain which generate the sensations of pleasure. So when you eat things that you like to eat, the reason you think you like to eat that is because the brain is rewarding you with the pleasure of dopamine release, dopamine generating experiences of pleasure. And if a person has experienced pleasure in the past from eating a particular food, they will have the desire to reproduce this sensation by further eating. Now, when enough food has been eaten, another area of the hypothalamus produces a feeling of satisfaction. So it's the hypothalamus which starts as eating and then the hypothalamus says, okay, we're satisfied now, we've had enough to eat. And the group of neurons producing this feeling of satisfaction after eating is referred to as the satiety centre. We become satiated. We have had enough to eat. And hopefully this is homeostatically regulated to maintain the ideal body weight. Of course, very often it isn't, um, but we'll have to look at that another time. The gastrointestinal tract has to be regulated and the activity of the gastrointestinal tract and indeed the accessory organs of digestion must be controlled and tightly regulated and this is achieved by neural and hormonal control mechanisms. Now there are two aspects to the neuronal control referred to as intrinsic and extrinsic. The intrinsic nerves are autonomic fibres which are located actually in the wall of the tract, which coordinate local muscular activity and secretory activity, secretion of juices into the digestive tract. Extrinsic nervous control involves the autonomic nervous system which communicates directly with the central nervous system. So afferent sensory neurons convey information from the gut into the central nervous system. Efferent motor neurons carry information from the central nervous system out to modify the activity of the digestive system. There are some sympathetic fibres involved in control of the gut, but most, the vast majority of extrinsic neuronal control of the gastrointestinal tract is parasympathetic often via the cranial nerve, the famous 10th cranial nerve, the vagus nerve. Sympathetic nerve fibres exert an inhibitory effect on the activity of the gastrointestinal tract, whereas parasympathetic fibres stimulate activity. Some of the cells which line the gut produce endocrine hormones, and these specialised cells are called enteroendocrine cells, enteroendocrine. Entero, enteric means to do with the gut. So enteroendocrine cells. And the hormones they produce are systemically absorbed, but affect and regulate other hormone, other organs of the digestive system. And they're actually very complicated um, systems that are being currently discovered relating to the hormonal control of the gastrointestinal tract. Well, this is the end of the first part of this presentation. Now we need to look at the individual components of the gastrointestinal tract and what goes on there. So next we're going to look at the mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, sequentially learning about the anatomy and physiology of these particular regions. So see you in part two.